Hi, my name is Brian Curtis, and I am the founder of Decentralized Systems. And today with me, I have Craig James, who is the founder, I assume, of Berry House Coffee. No, actually, yeah, I'm the CEO of Berry House Coffee. It was Berry House was founded in 1934. Oh, wow. I guess I didn't uh, know uh, the history of it. I'm from the West Coast, so is it an East Coast company? Yeah, we are. We're located in the New York City market. So uh, like I said, we've been here for since 1934, so about 88 years, um, supplying great coffees to the, the New York City market and all up and down the East Coast and a little bit out West as well. Awesome. So I'll start with the first obvious question. You know, how did you become CEO of a coffee company? I, I'm curious to hear this story. Yeah, great question, uh, Brian, and I appreciate it. Um, so uh, if I unwind all the way back, uh, <laughs> I was actually a, a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America up in Hyde Park, New York, so about an hour up the river from us here, um, focused in culinary arts. But when I got out, I, I really turned my attention to pastries. And so I was a pastry chef for about six years, uh, finished at a place called um, Au Petit Delice in Philadelphia as the head pastry chef there, got into the oil industry. So I then uh, went back to school and got picked up by Mobile Oil and was with Exxon Mobil for about 22 years, uh, working all in their uh, downstream division, uh, all, all different types of roles from operations, distribution, sales, marketing, controllers, you name it. I kind of touched it on the, on the downstream side. And then how did you go from pastries to oil just out of <laughs> just out of curiosity? Vegetable oil, crude oil, what's the difference? Oh, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, it was just, you know, fortunate. I, I had a neighbor and a, a good friend who uh, was working for mobile. And when I went back to school, they uh, hooked me up with a position over there for a, just a summer position. And it turned into uh, employment at the end of summer. So ever since then, it was a uh, I fell into the the mobile mold and and the Nexon Mobile came in and purchased us and gave me a really lovely career there. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. How it's funny how our life changes, right? You just never know which direction it's going to go. You meet one person and all of a sudden, boom, you're just doing something totally different. Absolutely. And and that's pretty much how I got into uh Berry House as well. So, um the one of the owners were owned by three brothers, 100% family owned business. One of the owners, uh, Barry Goldstein, his wife, Amy, and I actually went to culinary school together and we graduated in the same class. And so she reached out to me after about 26 years. Um, and we started talking about her husband and the, the coffee company and the direction they were going. And they were asking for some advice. Uh, they were kind of at a crossroads of where they wanted to go. And we hit it off and I decided to step away from Exxon Mobil after 22 years and stepped into the coffee industry. Awesome. So uh, how many employees does Berry House employ? Uh, we have about 74, 75 employees. Okay. And spread out pretty close to that area or do you have other? Yeah, we have, sorry, we have uh, two facilities. We have our Mount Vernon roasting plant where we've got about six employees down there. Uh, we have a sales team and then the majority of the folks are up here in Elmsford, New York. Okay. Yeah. There's a Mount Vernon here in Washington state too, but uh, I think there's Mount Vernon's everywhere. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Grew up in Northern Virginia. And so we certainly had a Mount Vernon down there as well. Right. So is it, is the coffee industry pretty competitive? I would guess it's fairly competitive over there. Is there, is there a lot of coffee companies in uh, upstate New York? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of coffee companies all around, all around the world. Um, coffee in the United States is about an $80 billion industry. So it's extremely fragmented. Um, and for me coming from the oil industry where, you know, we pretty much could count all our major competitors on, on one hand, um, the coffee industry is extremely fragmented. So lots and lots of players, very low barriers to entry in order to get into the industry. Um, and uh, yeah, so quite competitive. Uh, yeah. So um, to get back on my usual topics, I'm really curious to see, hear about people's companies, you know, and how they how they uh, get into the business. But I'm, I always like to focus on personal growth and group development. Sure. So, so um, do you guys have any like employee engagement uh, problems or it sounds like, you know, if you have just 75 people, uh, most people probably know each other pretty well, correct? 
Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we're a family business. And so it's really important to us that we set that tone and, and keep that tone across the organization. Um, when the family brought me in, you know, coming from a very structured organization like ExxonMobil, uh, for me, it was all about putting a foundation and structure in place into the business, making sure we had documented processes, standard operating procedures, those type of things. Um, but the, the whole culture that we built here is really around people and around uh, communications and empathy and, and you know, working together. So our whole focus has, has really been more on the employees um, because if you take care of the employees, then they'll take care of the business. And, and you know, that's been the philosophy that, I, that I've focused on. Coming from a very safety-oriented organization like ExxonMobil, coming into a manufacturing family business like this, uh, I implemented safety in the first week I was here. So like I said, my belief is you take care of the employees, you, they take care of each other, and then everyone will take care of the business. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, I've worked in a lot of different safety atmospheres, and some of them are a lot more um, accepting and productive than other ones. You know, some of them seem like they're a little bit restrictive and they they uh, have a tendency to, to break down the work atmosphere more than they help. Um, is that something that you, you've dealt with or do you have have you had any employee pushback as far as any kind of safety measures you put in place? Yeah, no, we we haven't had any pushback from the employees. And in fact, that was one of the things that really they the employees embraced and okay. um, helped us change the culture. So when I came in, you know, again, my whole focus was open door. I actually removed two doors. Um, we had an a, a office door to our wing and then my own office door as well. And I had both of them removed my first day to truly drive the open door policies. And then I walk around quite a bit to, to really talk to the employees, understand what's going on in their lives. And I see my role and the leadership team seems, sees their role is what can we do to take the obstacles away for employees? Um, manufacturing is, is challenging on a good day and yeah. you know, be able to roll with the punches and work through the obstacles and, and find solutions to help folks do the best that they can do and, and be the best that they can be in the position's been our number one priority. Awesome, that's encouraging. And I've always said, you know, my the first question I can usually ask a CEO and kind of, you can kind of gauge um, how healthy the company is, is how often do you talk to your frontline employees? Yeah. Right? I mean, I, I've, I've talked to, I don't know, a lot of different business owners and uh, that, that seems to be the number one most uh, deciding uh, conversation is if, if you're not developing relationships all the way up and down the line, then um, they, things fragment, right? Um, yeah. People, people start to work under false premises. You know, they, they don't know where you're coming from. So, and if you're not talking to them, then they, you know, a lot of people will just assume the worst, right? Um, right? I've been in so many different atmospheres where that was the case, unfortunately. And all it really took was to make sure people were talking and, you yeah. know, you just have to open lines of communication, right? Exactly. I, if you think about most things in life, it really all boils down to communications. And, yeah. you know, we have amazing folks and and they have a voice and we want to make sure that we hear that voice, Um and, and ensure that we're doing what we can do to make sure that their um, their time here at Berry House is, is the best that it can be. You know, we all spend a lot of time at work and this becomes our second family away from our, our outside lives. So we got to make it enjoyable. We got to got to listen to folks, understand what what drives them, what motivates them. And then on a daily basis, go out and inspire and, and help them be the best they can. Yeah, that's nice. So since you were a pastry chef, yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more. I want to hear more about uh, what kind of pastries you was it uh, like a cake factory or was it? Um... We were a little French uh, patissier, and okay. so we did all scratch chocolates, all scratch uh, doughs and breads and cakes, um, cookies. Uh, the gentleman um, Patrick Gautron, who was my the owner and, and top chef of the uh, patissier, uh, he was a pastry chef at Lebec Fen for many years in Philadelphia. Uh, so all the recipes were were from his family in Burgundy, and we just had the opportunity of really, you know, um, taking and driving that business. So we were best in Philly for chocolates and wedding cakes and all sorts of things. But it was really more scratch um, pastries from a with a French um, background to them. Yeah, I've actually dabbled in trying to make chocolates myself, and it's not easy. It's there's yeah. real technique in making chocolate. That's yeah, really, really making sure that you temper the chocolate and the chocolate's at the right temperature. Yeah, uh, 
is extremely important de depending upon whether you're making a ganache or coating or those type of things. So, yeah, and the the temperature for like you said is is paramount. And then you know what kind of sugars to use. You can't just use any kind of sugar, right? I mean, I've experimented with a lot of different kinds of sugars, and most things don't play nice with just chocolate you have to use the right type of sugars that's for sure no that's true but you know the good thing is is the even the mistakes taste great so <laughs> all right yeah it's just chocolate and sugar right even exactly. if it's a little lumpy <laughs> <laughs> huh so um i have a, a question for you what would you say was your um did you have an experience where where you felt like you overcame a challenge specifically where maybe you weren't um familiar with the type of work you were doing and maybe you worked in a team environment where you guys overcame a challenge that uh, you're real proud of over the years. Yeah, I think, you know, um, the, the most, the largest challenge that we've worked through that I, I'm most proud of is, uh, is really more recent as it relates to the, the pandemic. So here we are, family business, coffee industry. Uh, we do a lot of, of, um, we support a lot of the local businesses around us, restaurants, food service, offices, and whatnot. When the pandemic hit, everything got shut down. Uh, and so it was a, a pretty significant impact to our business. We were strong on the retail side, so that kind of kept us moving along. But from a food service and restaurant and hospitality, it just it disappeared overnight. Um, we made a pact very early on in the pandemic that we weren't going to release any of our employees, that we would keep them employed keep them safe and keep them healthy. And so that's what we rallied the business around was, you know, we'll work through this challenge. And it, at first everybody thought it was a two week challenge. And, you know, two years later, we, you know, I would say we're, we've worked ourselves through it. Um, but the team has been phenomenal. You know, it, it's really about coming together, increasing communications, we had attrition just like a, a lot of other industries and companies with the great resignation that was going on, yet yeah. true to our values of, of holding our employees in place and taking good care of them. So um, we're on a recovery mode now and, and growing significantly. We're up, up just over 15% versus prior year, which is huh. extremely strong growth in the industry. So we're, we're quite pleased at the progress that we're making. And, you know, yesterday we had the opportunity to uh, have a little employee engagement and, and recognition event. And we were handing out uh, um, awards to folks who, and who have been with us for many, many years. And so, you know, these are folks 27 years, 35 years. Um, and it was just great to, to know the fact that we can celebrate this while going through a, a pandemic where a lot of companies cut people. We, we really rallied around and, and protected them and, say, and kept them in place. Awesome. So um, what kind of challenges were there in the retail market? I know you probably had to shut down the, the restaurant, but uh, did anything change as far as retail goes, as far as protecting, um, you know, how you delivered? And yeah, I, I'm sure that things changed a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we there was a sudden uptick on the retail side of the business. So when I talk retail, it's all the grocery stores and those type of things mm -hmm. that we in as well. Um, so a lot of focus in that, our e-commerce business increased um, three, 400 fold. So uh, really great progress in that. What was really considered more of an afterthought in our business became actually a viable business model on the e-com uh, front. So retail um, change, we, we put a lot more emphasis on it. In the middle of the pandemic, we relaunched our brand, uh, which was very interesting and, and really got our Berry House branded products all around the New York market. So. Our goal is to own our backyard and to really drive and, and make Berry House, which was a little known name in the in the New York market, even though we've been here for 88 years, no one really knew our brand because we were very focused on every on developing everybody else's brands. Right. Hmm. So do you guys have your own specific roasts that you kind of advertise in the area that is unique to just your company? Yeah, so we have our Clay Avenue. So the, the business started on Clay Avenue in the Bronx here in okay. New York. And uh, basically the, the family were, was um, buying roasted coffee at the time, back in the 30s and 40s. They were grinding it in the garage of their grandmother and then putting it in little paper sacks and stapling it closed and delivering it all around the city. So um, as a nod to the family, we developed a really nice blend that's, uh, that's very balanced and, and easy drinking. Um, but really represents the the family and a nod to the family of their origins at Clay Avenue. Cool. 
Well, I guess we could wrap up here. Do you have anything you'd like to share with anybody that uh, would maybe tell a little bit more about the business? I think we've got overview most of it, but uh, I'm, I'm always interested to hear maybe another story or. Um, yeah. So, you know, coffee has been extremely good to the family throughout the years, three, three generations. Um, and one of the big things with me coming in is they really want to give back to the industry. And so we've kicked off a lot of different initiatives and programs heavily focus on sustainability. Uh, we have a great uh, relationship with Fair Trade USA. The majority of our product lineup is Fair Trade products, Fair, fair Trade and organic products. And so we're, uh, we're heavily focused on, on doing right in the communities that we live in and the communities that we source our coffees from and we source from all around the world. So um, our, our big focus and, and one of the, the great things that we've done recently as well is we have collaborated with Catia University out of Costa Rica, which developed these uh, pure seedlings uh, specific to the farm and the environments. We worked. We are working with two women-owned farms down in Costa Rica. We bought five thousand of the plants, planted them into the farms, and now we're waiting for three years until we can get the first uh, first harvest out of them. But it's a great collaboration, and, and we basically closed the whole cycle by committing to purchase the coffees for five years once uh, once they start to bear fruit. So it's just a great opportunity to draw draw a focus toward gender equity in the industry and doing our part to ensure that there's there's focus and communications around that. Um, while also from a sustainable standpoint, working with different types of varietals, which will help sustain the industry longer term be more resistant to climate change and, and producing a, a larger harvest. So those type of things, it, it's just, you know, like I said, we want to be a, a good good partner in the communities. Um, coffee is is all about community and, and comradeship and, and getting together. And so we just want to do our part too. Yeah, everybody always gets together for coffee, right? I mean, that's just the universal standard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was in uh, Puerto Rico last year, and I I did I had forgotten, and I probably heard it before, but Puerto Rico is a main exporter of uh, coffee beans, uh, and they're kind of at the same uh, uh, latitude that Costa Rica is. So it makes sense that Costa Rica has quite a few uh, coffee farms there. Uh, I guess there are probably quite a few smaller growers too, and that's how you guys found the uh, smaller growers there in Costa Rica or? Yeah, absolutely. Most of the small growers uh, usually become part of co-ops. Uh, okay. It's just easier for them to, to pull all their, their fruit together, all the beans together, and then the co-op itself will sell into the market. So they'll get a little bit more um, um, power, if you will, to be able to, to manage the, the, not only the harvesting of the coffee, but also the milling of the coffee itself to get it to a form of where it can get shipped to the U.S., um, a lot of a lot of large farms and some of the medium sized farms have mills, wet mills um, attached to them or as part of their operations, but the smaller folks don't. And so it gives them an opportunity they can work with the mills and the co-ops to be able to get their product to uh, to market. If they need to roast them at the same time, too, before they ship them. No, we actually do all the roasting here. Okay. So we'll get the, the um, coffee beans will come to us green. We'll run them through a cleaning process to make sure that there's no wood or anything, you know, that can come out of some of these third world countries in, in the sack of coffees that we receive. Um, run them through our cleaning device and then we'll roast to order. So it's all about quality. It's all about freshness for us. Cool. Well, if I make it to the East Coast here in the next couple of months, I'll definitely look you up. Please do. I'd love to give you a tour, Brian. And, um, you know, um, I'll, I'll communicate to you via email, but let's uh, happy to send you some of our amazing coffees as well. Yeah, that'd be great. And I'm always, I'm glad to connect with people who are, you know, very focused on creating the best relationships in their work environment as possible. Because, you know, if you've worked in enough environments, and I'm sure you're the same way, you realize that that's kind of the base of basis of everything, right? Mm -hmm. Everything comes out of that. The the desire to work and make a, you know, a sustainable product. And um, you can be proud of something when you're actually getting along and talking to everybody at work. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, people, people just want to feel valued and they want to feel like they have a purpose in what they're doing and every role here counts. And, and that's the message that we constantly talk to our employees about is, you know, we want to hear them. We want to understand what's going on, but we also want them to understand that, you know, what they do each and every single day is is extremely valuable to the end consumer who sits down on a Sunday morning and, and enjoys that amazing cup of coffee.
Oh, that's yeah, that's a good message. All right, Craig. Well, thanks for joining me today. It was wonderful meeting you and hearing about uh, your experience. Uh, that's a actually a very interesting journey. How you can go from pasty chef to uh, you know mobile one or mobile oil, and then uh, and then to a coffee company. So yeah, that's a good story. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a fun journey for sure, and uh, really enjoying the coffee industry and what we can do here. So just trying to leave my mark in the world positively. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Take care. You too.